Hi friends, welcome back to First Church of God. As you notice, we're outside today and there's a few little things about being outside when you're doing these kind of videos that make it a little bit more challenging. So uh, bear with me today. I'm so glad that you're here. And um, one of the things I'm noticing as I mature, uh, okay, I'm getting older, yes. Uh, there are times when it's difficult to hear someone else. Some voices uh, we are meant to hear, others we're not meant to hear. And it's very important to figure out which ones to give ear to and which ones to ignore. Also, I've noticed as I get older, I'm not hard of hearing, I'm slow of hearing. There are some people that can come up to me and they rattle off so many words in a short period of time, I can't understand them. And I ask, have to ask them, slow down. Uh, and, but there are voices that come into our lives that we need to be able to tune out. If you watched a uh, Earlier in the week, there was a video about our ear and how our ear is shaped like the womb of a, a, a mother's womb where a baby is born. And it's very important that we guard our ear because of the voices and the things that come in. We want to be careful uh, of what we place in someone else's ear, but we also have to be careful of what we pick up within our own ear because we can either have something of greatness or something of destruction come into our ear. Um, your tongue, my tongue, it has the power of life and death, according to the Word of God. And so we can take people up or we can take people down. Many, um, many people have uh, been deeply scarred or hurt because of unhealthy words that others have said to them. Or others have been healed because of the healthy words that have been said to them, words that come from God the Father. Back in 1977, there was a commercial for a uh, perfume that said, if you want to catch someone's attention, whisper. Whispering is a very powerful way to communicate because people wonder what we're saying. But if you read the scripture, it says that both God and Satan whisper. It says sin whispers, and it said God whispers. And the only way to hear a whisper is you've got to be close enough to the one that is speaking to be able to hear it. So I invite you to look with me to the book of Joshua chapter 1 because we see God speaking here some very powerful things. I love the book of Joshua. Um, before we go into the scripture that we're going to look at today, I'll tell you a little bit of personal story because I think that Joshua is so powerful in that um, it gives us commands, but it also gives us promises. And if we will heed the commands, we will see the promises fulfilled. Back about 2015, 2016, somewhere, maybe 14, um, I had to do something very, very difficult. My dad was uh, declining with Alzheimer's and I had to tell him he could no longer drive his boat. I really did not want to have this conversation and it did not go well. I left the house and went outside for a while. I was going to go for a walk and before I even got off of the sidewalk onto the street to walk, I hear the voice of God say, Moses, my servant is dead. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. And I realized then that God spoke to me and he was saying, it's going to be all right. I am with you as I was with your dad, as I've been with your family, I am with you. So it's assuring that uh, there are so many promises here that if we will just listen to the commands, we will see that God is always faithful. Um, so move down to verse seven and look at this. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you to do. Do not turn from the it to the left or to the right, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always in front of you. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. You uh, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. For 39 years, these former slaves, inmate slaves, they had been working hard, but for 39 years they've been wandering the desert. Now they're about to enter the promised land. And in this passage of scripture, God gives them a command. It's not a suggestion. 
It's not something to think, think about. It's not a guilt motivation. He gives them this promise as he gives them the command, and he continues to fulfill this promise day after day. At that time, Joshua had direct access to what God had said in the past. Moses had written it down. Uh, but we too have direct access to what God has said when we talk about having the Bible. So we have this access uh, and like we are more fortunate than a lot of foreign countries because we possess Bibles uh, readily in our country. It's a freedom that we have. So don't don't uh, forfeit that, that freedom. It's one thing to possess a Bible. It's another thing for the Bible to possess you. So look again at verse 8. It says, keep the book of the law always on your uh, um, lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. God doesn't give Joshua more laws to add, doesn't give him more commands to add. Uh, he tells him to keep what he already has been given and to hold tight to it uh, so that it would and allow it to work in your life. God didn't say go find these books and read up and so you can understand what is written here. Um, everything's ready for you to experience. Of anything and everything that is available to us, I think that the Bible is the most important tool that we can have in our spiritual growth. Now, somebody asked me one time, what do you think the most important tool that you could have in a toolbox would be? And it's a toss up between a screwdriver or a, um, a pair of pliers. Uh, those two are very important to me. But uh, for me, spiritually, I need the Word of God. A man by the name of Greg Hawkins and uh, Callie Parkinson, they did a study. And then they concluded, nothing has a greater impact on spiritual growth than reflection on Scripture. In church, if churches could do only one thing to help people all uh, at all levels of spiritual maturity grow in their relationship with Christ, their choice is clear. They would inspire, encourage, and equip their people to read the Bible. In other words, if you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, it isn't found in the sermon. It's not found in the singing. It's not found in the fellowship dinner. It, it's not found in your personal spiritual activity uh, or in the busyness of the church. Those things are good, but they're not going to help you grow spiritually like reading the Word of God and trusting the Word of God will do. And I have found that trying to read through the Bible in a year doesn't work for me. The guy come to this point where it becomes something to just check off my list of things to do. But what I love to do is take the time and slowly read and be more like a sponge as I read the Word of God and soak it in. Uh, there needs to be a plan because without a plan, you are only going to be wandering around. It's kind of like the young boy whose dad says, hey, I want you to go out and plow the field, but I want you to make sure you keep the rows straight. And to keep the rows straight, you need to pick a spot on the other end of the field and keep your eyes on it. Well, the dad goes out and checks on him, and the rows are as crooked as some of the roads in Missouri, all twisted and, and turning everywhere. And dad says, I thought I told you to pick a spot and keep your eye on it. He said, Dad, I did pick something to keep my eyes on, but the rabbit kept hopping around. What are you focusing on that is far ahead? God's word gives God's principles, and principles are firm and they never change. God's word doesn't change, God doesn't change, and we should make it the authority of our life. So when you think about our church, you think about your church, I believe that the Bible is the foundation for everything that we believe. And without the Bible, we don't really have much of a reason to read, to meet together. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 16, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been uh, convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. God gives us this, this great reason to read scripture because it makes us wise for salvation. Not only this, but James says, don't just be hearers of the word, do what it says. So partial obedience is disobedience to God. One day, Jesus and the disciples, uh, they were at the boat. Jesus says, hey, get in the boat. Let's go to the other side. So they jump in, they cast off, and about halfway, a storm comes up. 
Where's Jesus? He's in the back of the boat. He's sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples are panicking. And they're going, hey, don't you care if we drown? And he, they wake him up. Uh, now, when they wake him up, Jesus could have said, are we there yet? He could have said, hey, have we arrived on the other side? And if not, why are you waking me up? I said we were going to the other side. Instead, Jesus stands up and he says, do you still have no faith? And then he rebukes the storm and the water is calm. The disciples fail to take Jesus at his word. He said, we are going to the other side, not halfway. And when the storm came up and the sails uh, went down, their faith went down and they suddenly had spiritual amnesia to his word. We're all have, we all have storms in our life. Some are greater than others. Some are, uh, are we're going into, some we're in the middle of, some we're coming out of, some we're getting ready to go in. And when the winds and the waves hit and the rock is, uh, the boat is rocked, what do you hear? Do you hear Christ or do you hear crisis? Do you hear promises or do you hear problems? How much you trust God's word is seen on how deep you are rooted when the storms, it shows how deep you are rooted when the storms of life spring up. God told Joshua to meditate on God's word day and night. Paul wrote, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. God's word is powerful. And one of the beautiful things about God's word is that it's timeless. It never gets outdated. It is a living document. Uh, it, uh, when you make a goal for yourself, you have created a living document. Changes can be made. Improvements can happen. There's going to be setbacks. But you know what? God's word is perfect. It doesn't need additions. It doesn't need changes. It is alive. It's a living document. Philippians or Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. If we ignore God's word, it's like uh, skipping a step when you're trying to assemble something. Failure will happen. So I think for God's word to really be effective in our life, we need to tune in. Tune. If something is in tune, it's got a good sound to it. If it's out of tune, ooh, every note is wrong. So how do we do that? Letter T, trust and truth. We can trust God's word because it is truth. Trusting God and speaking truth begins the process of turning, um, of tuning into uh, uh, the better of the whispers. And it also helps protect us from the lying whisperer. John 10 verse 26, it says, You don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snap, snatch them away from me. Sheep know the shepherd's voice. Why? Because they've spent time with him. If, if we give ourselves to him and we listen to his voice, what we will, we're going to know uh, him better than we ever imagined. And the Savior already knows us. And, he, and so he knows what our voice sounds like. But spending time with him, we get to hear his voice. And what I find is his voice is in the voice of the fruit of the spirit that we most need to hear. To know somebody's voice, you got to have a relationship with them. And it's the same with Jesus. The more time you spend with him, the more you're going to know his voice. Someone said you cannot complain that you're not hearing God's voice if your Bible is closed. And if you, if you rarely read the Word of God, you will rarely see the presence and the power of God. We, we, when fear and doubt creep into your life, you've got to proclaim, I trust you, God, and I claim the power of your Word, which says uh, that you are the one true God. Personally, I try to read a promise a day from God's Word because when I read a promise, it causes me to walk in, in anticipation of what God is going to do next. It keeps my eyes forward instead of backwards. Letter U, unite with God. I call this prayer. In prayer, we need to have a time of gratitude to God, and as, we, as well as praise and repentance and surrender. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his suffering, becoming uh, more like him in death. 
Right now, you are as close to God as you choose to be. Jesus wants you to know the voice that he created in you, but to unlock the voice of, uh, of your purpose, you have to know his voice first. You gotta be a sheep that is willing to follow and not walk in rebellion. And when you, uh, when you unite with Jesus and you follow him, you'll never know what it'll be like to go somewhere without someone who knows your voice. Let her in. This is an important one. This is a tough one. Neutralize the negativity in your life. Even when you make time for God and you unite with God, negativity is going to come in uh, into the course of your day. The negativity can be the noise that blocks you from hearing the voice of God. And the key is to turn out the, the those noises and tune into the speaking truth of God's word. God's word is truth. If someone comes up to you and they're talking about everything that is wrong, you need to ask them, pause, time out, think about this. What is going on that is good in your life? Tell me what is going good in your life. And keep forcing them to come up with something that is good. It may be that their shoelaces didn't break. It may be that they got to eat today, but something good has happened in their life and they need to focus on it. Then ask them, okay, tell me what is wrong. And after they told you what is wrong, say, okay, what can we do to fix this? Uh, I've mentioned recently Dr. James Gills. This man is the only person that has run six double uh, uh, Ironman triathlons. In his last triathlon, he was 59 years old. And he learned he had to talk to himself rather than listening to himself. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not uh, let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be benefit that it may benefit those who listen. So one of the people that's going to benefit from your voice is yourself. What's coming out of your mouth? Well, what comes out of your mouth is what you've allowed through your ear gate and into your heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Letter E, elevate your thinking. If we are what we eat, we are what we think. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2.15 instructs us, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and we teach them to obey Christ. To take, uh, to take the thoughts captive, we've got to guard that ear gate so we can guard the heart gate to protect the mind so we can protect our mouth. It, it goes back to trust and truth. And the more you surrender yourself with the surround yourself with the truth, the real thing, the easier it is to recognize the counterfeits and the whispers of the enemy. So what would it look like if you took one of those four things of tune and started applying it to your life this week? Do you think your life could be better? I believe it could, but the best thing to do is trust in Jesus Christ. Bye-bye.